Labor is a tool that applies to every aspect of life. And when it's the right type of work, something you have legitimate passion for, labor can go incredibly far to improve the human condition and to make life tangibly more rewarding and satisfying. But in our world, a capitalist world, labor is mostly just seen as your job as an employee. And since making money is necessary for survival and we can't all take our pick, most people end up with jobs that they don't like. What happens when most of your society doesn't care for the work that they perform? Mental health crises, entire countries that live for the weekend, rapid and intense burnout, none of which is good. <laughs> that question of how to run a capitalistic society without the workers inevitably becoming disillusioned, alienated, and resentful of their labor has gone unanswered for a long time, until this guy took a shot at it. The American run of the office builds the foundation for its stories on labor, and in particular how everyday people relate to labor within a capitalist society. Through a mockumentary filming a mid-2000s office space, The Office explores the alienation that millions of middle-class workers throughout the industrialized world feel on a daily basis. Well, if this were my career, I'd have to throw myself in front of a train. By taking the quintessential American workplace, The Office, and showcasing one of the most hotly contested and unresolved problems of modern capitalism, which is that in a globalized world filled to the brim with large bureaucratic businesses, as well as the total and complete dominance of capitalist interests, how can average everyday employees find purpose and meaning in their work? This is a dilemma that I'm going to refer to as a capitalist question for the rest of this video, so don't forget that or I will be upset. And when rewatching The Office, for this video, I notice a pretty distinct trend. The show's answer to the capitalist question changes, and it changes drastically as the show ages. So let's start from the beginning and analyze exactly what The Office tells us about work, about economics, and about the eternal feud between the employer and the employee. <laughs> God, you were, we totally got you. You're a jerk. I don't know about that. Season 1 of The American Office starts out in a pretty interesting spot, with a focus on irony, resentment, and a lack of any saving grace in the lives of these overtly miserable people. Michael is a stereotypical, incompetent boss. He's crass and lacks any sense of self-awareness. Damn it, Michael! Dwight is a kiss-ass. Pam is stuck on inertia, unable to kick herself out of her dead relationship with her high school boyfriend. And Jim is just Jim. The first season is rugged and almost feels in line with something like Space Goes Coast to Coast or the early Eric Andre show. There's a dissociative feel to the environment and the dialogue, presenting what almost comes off as a dystopian reality where our characters have no choice but to work in this hellscape of an office every single day. The threat of downsizing looms over their heads, they never leave, and they're never happy. The humor is in their misery. Really is something then that by the end of the show, the office swings to the complete opposite end of the pendulum, showcasing an office where pretty much all all the workers do is have fun, party, pull pranks, and could not be more grateful working for an out-of-touch paper company too big for its own good. But I'm jumping ahead, and that's no good. Overall, season one is not that great. The jokes lack comedic timing, the stories are pretty much just ripped from the British version. None of the characters really have any sense of relatability with the exception of Jim. And when the only character to like is Jim, <laughs> you got a problem. So it's even more interesting that arguably one of the worst seasons of the show also gave such a fascinating depiction of the middle class in the mid to late 2000s. The 2000s was a completely different world, and I'd argue a worse off world than the one we got right now. The culture was pessimism defined, organized labor was at its weakest point in 60 years, this guy was still around, and the internet was only now beginning to live up to the crazy expectations placed on the technology in the late 1990s. Levers of power and influence were still just as solidified in the hands of the wealthy and the well-connected as they were in the 90s. But unlike the largely optimistic and sometimes naive 90s, 2000s culture was full of angst and disillusionment. Season 1 of The Office represents that angst perfectly. Everywhere you look is bureaucracy and boredom, all the wrong people have all the power, and the employees checked out ages ago. So when The Office started, the answer to the capitalist question of how to find meaning and purpose in your work was pretty much just to laugh and admit that you can't. And while this is a pragmatic answer, it's also a complete downer, and not necessarily true. Now, the second season is when The Office really begins to shine. 
From the beginning of season two, it's obvious that the writers have learned from the mistakes of season one. The lights are brighter, the shots are more creative, and the characters are much more well-defined. But most importantly, the stories are more compelling, and the humor is worlds better. And so much of that comes from putting compelling, personal, relatable stories on the backdrop of a workplace in 21st century United States of America, where labor unions are in tatters, a union? where blue-collar workers are treated like their minds and bodies are disposable, and where grueling, soulless, this white collar work has become the norm for hundreds of millions of lives. But while the grim economic realities of season one are still just as obvious, the characters' reactions have changed and changed drastically. And it's here where the office's answer to the capitalist question hits a stable compromise. Until institutional changes are made to address how businesses burn out everybody from the warehouse to their executives at corporate, a lack of creative freedom and a pervasiveness of micromanagement that is oh so common within business culture, and the lack of any first-hand connection to your work, until these issues are addressed, employees have no choice but to either struggle in solitude or find comfort in the people around them. People that, once they get to know, can make the daily grind a little easier. It's literally that Billy Joel song, Piano Man. You know, they're miserable, but at least they're miserable together. And this kind of overarching narrative works really well with the characters in the story of The Office. It allows for unique plot points, like how even people at the top of publicly traded companies, people who by all accounts have lived the American dream and who the capitalist system rewards, can find themselves more broken and unhappy than their downtrodden employees. We see the workers begin to open up, to be vulnerable in front of each other, and to take risks against the monotony of their daily grind. But while characters like Jan struggle to find meaning through the people around her, and instead decides to largely suffer alone, the Scranton branch of the office begins to embrace the absurdity of their middle management white-collar lives. In the episode Christmas Party, the show even dupes you into first thinking this will be more cringe comedy, where Michael's social ineptitude ruins everybody's day. But the writers do a complete 180 halfway through the episode as the workers come together for the Christmas party, ending with one of the most heartwarming scenes of the entire show, the first time Michael gets invited out to drinks with his co-workers. Michael? Paul Richards? Yeah, that sounds good. Season 2 is great, and the answer to the capitalist question at this point of the show is not just honest, but also attainable for many employees. But enjoy it while it lasted because from here, things begin to go in a different direction. Seasons three and four carry over most of the themes of season two. The corporate ineptitude, the Jim and Pam story now becoming a love triangle with new character Anne, I mean Anne, I mean Karen, until they finally get together. And the show is still focused as ever on grim economic realities. We see the freedoms afforded to Martin in prison that he can enjoy at the Scranton branch of the office. We see how Dunder Mifflin really has no answers on how to stay relevant in an increasingly digital world. And we see the fears of downsizing introduced in the first season finally come to a head. The show still uses the workplace and its flaws to accentuate its storytelling and to create realistic, interesting obstacles for the characters to overcome. But you notice something in these seasons, especially with season 4 ever so slightly, things have become a bit more cartoony. This isn't too much of a surprise. Flanderization almost always happens within sitcoms, where characters get more reliant on a few select traits over time, making them more one-dimensional, contributing to a more cartoonish feel. These are still well-done seasons that carry over the answer to the capitalist question from season two. The characters cope with the injustices, annoyances, and absurdities of the workplace by cultivating relationships with each other. All right, here we go. Hey guys. No. No, nope, you're done. Seasons five to seven are where things really begin to fall off where the expectations for a family-friendly, politically correct sitcom begin to show their stripes, and where the flagrant dishonesty of what working under capitalism is begins to creep in. At this point in its run, The Office was a ratings juggernaut, bringing in 9 million plus viewers per episode as a mainstay of NBC's primetime lineup, and the influence of sponsors and a need to maintain good PR for one of their most successful, widely watched shows is so obvious now. Gone are the hard-hitting stories of how the comfort of normalcy leaves many employees trapped in jobs they don't care for, how people with all the potential in the world settle for mediocrity, how too much success too quickly can give you a big head, a big ego, and cost you everything just as quick as you got it. Now don't get me wrong, 
the show is still good. Episodes like Business Trip and Shareholder Meeting are not only still hilarious, but also continue to develop the characters by placing them in environments that raise the stakes. You also had the story arc of the Michael Scott Paper Company, which I love, that took the struggles of the workplace in a whole new direction, from the employees of a publicly traded company to the employees of a new and struggling small business. And of course, Michael's send-off. So don't get it twisted, the show is still enjoyable at this juncture, but this is now season two, and the answer to the capitalist question has again changed. Maybe it was the influence of NBC or the now fat bank accounts of these once unknown actors, but when it comes to employees finding meaning and purpose in their work, The Office doesn't really have much of an answer anymore. The stories involving the workplace have become so cartoonish that it's hard to tell who could relate or live vicariously through them to begin with. They still use The Office space, but everything is just so safe now. We see nothing like this conversation in Season 2, where Jim shakes off the inertia and finally tells Pam what she needed to hear. You gotta take a chance on something sometime, Pam. I mean, do you want to be a receptionist here, always? Oh, excuse me. I'm fine with my choices. Oh. You are? While they obviously couldn't stick with sad, disillusioned characters forever, and it's fun to see Michael become an actually likable boss, there's so much commentary on the workplace that they just never tap into. Why not do a story where employees find out each other's salaries, and that some people are making a hell of a lot more than others? Why not do a union storyline, the one big arc that they tease in season 2 but that they never pulled the trigger on? Instead, we get this awkward middle ground, where the show still acknowledges that these are workers in an office, but doesn't really act like they are, with the exception of Michael Scott Paper Company. So so what happened here? What yielded this dramatic change from season 4 to season 5? Beyond the now mainstream appeal of The Office? The answer, in my opinion, can be found in when the fifth season began. September 25th, 2008. It started out 16 months ago as a mortgage crisis. It's official, we are in a recession. It's not easy to, to come in and, and move a family Let's out. Let's talk about the speed with which we are watching this market. 8, 8 million spirals. American families are expected to lose the their homes. against Wall Street gain new momentum today. The market is not functioning it properly. The worst uh, financial crisis in modern times. Time. The, the largest financial taken, disaster uh, in decades in this country. The market took up three balls the end of the a zero. Zero. There has been a widespread loss of confidence. Seasons 5 to 7 take place in the immediate aftermath of the Great Recession, the most devastating economic meltdown in almost 100 years. When millions of workers across the globe lost their jobs, when the financial companies that started the crisis were bailed out by the US government, and when contempt and disdain for banks, for governments, and for the capitalist system itself skyrocketed. People were angry. A lot of people had lost everything, and we're still dealing with the consequences of that recession today. I believe the network saw this carnage and the change in tone going into season 5, presenting a fantasy-esque image of a near-perfect workplace where the employees are optimistic, nobody is ever laid off, and the boss is a lovable idiot, worked to help pacify the now millions of everyday people watching The Office on a weekly basis. Airy narratives critical of the system we live in, it could yield more resentment and more skepticism of institutions. This new approach comes with both pros and cons. Pro side, the show now appeals to a wider demographic than they did in seasons 2 and 3. On the con side, the show is worse now, and now has to flagrantly lie to its viewers about what work and labor under capitalism are in order to keep them watching, in a way that they never had to do in seasons 2 to 4. Now there's nothing wrong with putting your characters in more outlandish stories that you probably wouldn't see in the real world. Threat Level Midnight was a great episode, despite being fairly absurd. The problem stems from how the workplace setting is now just nothing more than a stand-in to provide some kind of backdrop to our characters' antics. For a show that's entire premise was filming an average American workplace, showcasing how how white collar workers cope with the daily grind. How many average American workplaces have their boss's ex-girlfriend come in during work hours for a passive aggressive baby shower? Good comedy, but you're telling me they had to do another Jan storyline before they could give us a union storyline? Why should the audience care about Dunder Mifflin going bankrupt if they just get immediately bought out after Gail Bedecker comes by? Why should we keep watching after Michael leaves and we have this massive send-off with a real opportunity for a soft reboot of the show? A way to completely overturn the relationship between the employer and the employee after seven seasons of Michael Scott, only to end up getting D'Angelo. Will Ferrell shows up to be his replacement, but then but then he can't do a full season because he's Will Ferrell. So then D'Angelo gets hurt, and then Dwight becomes manager, but then he gets fired, so they try and find a new man. What was the point of this? Why not just introduce Michael's replacement as Michael's replacement from the beginning, and build up a rebrand of the show from the beginning of season 8? Like, they knew Will Ferrell could only do a few episodes, right? So it was clearly a sacrifice of good storytelling in favor of a short-term ratings pop. Was it worth it? 
NBC? Was it worth it to get Will Ferrell? <laughs> Even the Michael Scott Paper Company, the high point of these seasons, just ends after a few episodes. Damn it, Mike! And it sucks because this story had the potential to be a massive shakeup that the show is still writing desperately needed, but no. Within a few episodes, things just go back to normal. But you know, even with the lack of messaging on the capitalist question, the more cartoonish office that the characters now work in, and a notable shift in tone coinciding with, you know, this new post-recession paradigm, nothing will prepare you for the cliff they fall off from here. Everything I have, I owe to this job. I know, it's cliche to hate on these two seasons, everybody does it, but... The truth is, I didn't completely hate these two. Season 8 at least does a good job at building up Andy, who's immediately positioned as a new manager. We see him learn real-life leadership skills as he struggles to fill Michael's shoes, to juggle the expectations of the new boss, Robert California, and to let go of craving his parents' his validation. Episodes like Lotto show Andy learning how to manage conflict and solve problems that were never his to solve before, and without a mentor or anybody to guide him on how to lead, like Jim had with Michael. I think the show could have done a lot with this arc of the new manager who's a little in over his head and just desperately wants to do a good job. It's creative, there's a ton of directions you can go in, and obstacles you can put in Andy's way, as he learns, against pretty much all odds and expectations, how to thrive as an executive. But of course, we can't have nice things in this world, and that's not what we got. At this point, any of the edge or the subversion that the mockumentary format brought to the earlier seasons is entirely gone. The show becomes a parody of its earlier seasons, a poorly written fanfiction of what life was like for Dunder Mifflin following Michael's move to Colorado. Long gone are the unique plot devices in an office setting brings, attempts to collectively bargain, workplace discrimination, passive aggressive politicking, executives on power trips. Even Andy's promising character development completely sputters out by the end of the season with the introduction of... <sighs> Nelly, and just the awful, frustrating storyline where she takes his job and where Andy goes to Florida to get Aaron. Like, the Florida scenes are green screened in, they're awful. No one likes Nelly, they don't give us a reason to like Nelly. Who are we supposed to root for? Andy does get some edge back when he finally puts Robert California in his place, but then they just revert back to him being manager. Only this time they throw all his development out the window and he's suddenly terrible to everybody. Like a throwback to season one Michael that nobody asked for. Episode after episode, the characters do what? exactly. They party, and then they party some more. Then they go on a field trip, and then they go on trivia night. I mean, in the office space. The office space itself has become almost irrelevant to the story. There's nothing wrong with exploring these new settings. Nobody wants to see a carbon copy of the average American office, or they just watch season one. But abandoning your best plot device almost entirely, not a good call. At this point, the show might as well be called The Group of Friends. Put them in a bar or a police station or a strangely massive New York apartment, and the dynamic of the show would not change one bit. Now, to its credit, season nine does try and take more risks that the show hasn't taken in years. The show invests in developing Oscar and Angela for the first time, Jim and Pam fight for the first time, which could have been done a lot better, but was still way more interesting than their season 8 run, and while Plop is one of the most boring characters ever introduced, and I do not like him and I do not respect him, and the attempt to turn him and Aaron into the new Jim and Pam is really, really poorly done. I actually really like Clark. He's one of the few characters that actually feels like he has something to prove, playing the young, wide-eyed upstart trying to work his way up sales. And his chemistry with Dwight leads to some pretty funny moments. I also enjoyed Philly Jim. I know this plot point isn't that popular, but for the show to finally acknowledge that Jim has been treading water for years at Dunder Mifflin, just staying content with his own mediocrity, was way overdue. It's something that a lot of employees experience, especially after working at one job for decades. In the startup nature of athlete, contrast the stark differences between the new kids on the block and the large bureaucratic corporation just going with the motions. Episodes like Work Bus and Stairmageddon still shine bright, and Suit Warehouse is probably one of my favorite episodes of the entire show. But sadly, most of the positive traits of Season 9 are entirely offset by an even steeper decline into cartoonish storylines that couldn't hold a candle to the hard-hitting, rugged humor of seasons two and three. The terrible Broccoli Rob story with Andy, the mediocre farm episode, the paper airplane contest, and the continued flanderization of Aaron's character. The post-2008 shift that began in season seven towards pacifying the unruly and angry masses with the imagery of a fun, happy-go-lucky workplace is now set in stone as the new paradigm. And with these last two seasons comes The Office's final answer to the capitalist question of how employees can find purpose and meaning in their labor. 
They just can, man. The entire notion of workers being disillusioned by the labor they perform is completely gone at this point. Hell, they barely work anymore at all. They laugh, they play, they eat pies, they spin wheels. They couldn't be more happy to work at what's supposed to be an out-of-touch bureaucratic corporation with an outdated product. Are we seriously expected to believe that Dunder Mifflin, a mid-sized regional paper firm, has cracked the code to unbelievable levels of employee satisfaction and retention? On top of this new, almost childlike work environment, the show openly just tells the audience now that working a job, a day job, as an employee is a blessing. Everything I have, I owe to this job. This stupid, wonderful, boring, amazing job. Apart from Jim and Pam's weird marriage counseling divorce angle, the office space has become an overwhelming force for good in all of these people's lives, which is just not what the show was ever supposed to be. The Office thrived when showcasing the grim realities of capitalism to make audiences laugh, cry, and feel, while using its unique characters and the obstacles in their way to give audiences the hope that these people, despite the suburban dystopia they live in, can grow into better, happier, and more fulfilled human beings. Now, we get one-dimensional stories, flat and uninteresting dialogue, bosses nobody can relate to, stories that aren't given the time they need to develop, and Jimmy Fallon. What a mess. Now, I did like the finale, alright, the wedding was cool, all the callbacks were great, Michael coming back, fantastic. But by the end of the show, The Office's central themes of its earlier seasons have been eroded entirely. They still pay lip service to the older themes of the show in the finale, but that's just the finale. And it's upsetting, because seasons 2-4 to four knew how to balance the wild antics and unrealistic stories with an honest depiction of what it means to be a white-collar worker in a capitalist world. This balance worked, but as the mockumentary falls off and the sitcom takes over, the rawness of the show thins out completely and we're left with so much missed potential. Andy being torn down. Michael Scott Paper Company ending after a few episodes, teasing a union but never having the spine to follow through. Hell, they could have done a story where a top salesperson gets an offer for more pay and more respect at another company, with Michael and another boss getting into a bidding war over multiple episodes. Think the one-off they did with Stanley where he teases going to Utica, except actually fleshing out the story this time, instead of just using it as a setup to get Jim, Dwight, and Michael to prank Karen. That would have been so fun to see. Instead of making most of the warehouse vague, undefined villains or bad background characters that nobody cares about, the show could have used the crew to explore the lives of working class people, in contrast to the middle class we normally follow, and how even the drudge and boredom of an office pales in comparison to the danger, the lack of pay, the minimal benefits, and the no respect that blue collar workers in America so often face. It would have humanized the warehouse, opened up new story possibilities, and kept the show fresh in its later seasons. But we didn't get any of that. Instead, the office made the critical mistake of moving away from more dramatic stories, absurdist humor, and social commentary in favor of a more mainstream and safe sitcom style. And by the end of season 9, The Office's answer to the capitalist question has devolved into a poorly disguised propaganda piece, created and guided along by wealthy TV executives to distract the masses from the entire economy collapsing outside their front door. But, you know, still a pretty funny show.